Well, good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Brodi, your host for this program. Uh, I think, I know this program will air at different times in the future, but tonight it's airing on, of all things, uh, Halloween. But so I remind you Catholics out there that tomorrow's a day of obligation, All Saints Day. It's a wonderful day, which was connected to uh, this time of of season because All Saints Day was also connected with uh, the Reformation. Uh, you know, that's a, a different celebration for different folk. But uh, uh, we welcome you to the program. And our guest tonight is Lori Martinez, a former agnostic. And Lori, it's a, it's a great pleasure to invite you to the journey home. Nice to meet you. <laughs> it's good to have you here. Have you ever seen the program before? Yes. So did you, did you ever think you'd be on the program? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to have you here. I look forward to hearing your story. So let me get out of the way and invite you to go way back and start us off. Okay. Um, well, I was baptized Catholic and my younger brother and my older brother were both baptized Catholic. So I think shortly after my brother's or my younger brother was baptized is when my parents quit taking us to any church. Mm. I mean, so I don't remember us ever going, but they said we did. <laughs> um, you can't remember why or anything. They just um, No, they just, my mom calls herself a recovering Catholic. She okay. feels better now that she's done with it. I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but my dad was Protestant. He was raised brethren. My grandparents uh, served the church. My Actually, my grandfather was a brethren minister. Hmm. And so we, we'd go to church periodically whenever my grandfather happened to be preaching. But that was about the extent of our faith life. Um, I like to tell people that I was baptized Catholic but raised sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, my dad didn't really have any faith. Uh, mm. My mom, her family was all Catholic and they would send pictures of the First Communions and my mom actually went through Catholic school all the way through college and met and married my dad and quit being Catholic. So I uh, guess my dad had a little bit to do with it. So your dad was kind of a PK, a pastor's kid? Yes, right? yes. And um, well, I would go to church whenever I could but it was primarily when I spent the night with someone and their family went to church the next morning. So I, for several years, I tried to find friends that would let me spend the night and go to church with them. Because some reason I wanted to go to church. I liked it, but it was, it was a struggle. And so after a while, I just gave up on it. Um, Did you have a faith in God, you think, as a child? I always believed God existed. I wasn't sure about the Jesus thing. Mm. Um, as I got older in school, we studied mythology, and I thought, okay, Jesus, half man, half God, kind of like a Hercules character, but I didn't really have any grasp of what Catholicism was or who Jesus was. Mm. Um, I remember in my, when I was in high school, our Girl Scout troop went to Europe, and one of the places we went was Rome, and we got to go to mm. St. Peter's. and our Girl Scout leader, who happened to be Catholic, was explaining to us that Vatican City is actually its own country, and I didn't realize that. And I'm like, well, then what's the Pope called? Because, you know, we got presidents, we got premiers, we got monarchs, kings, queens. Does he have a special title? And she's like, yeah, he's called the Holy See. And I'm like, what does C stand for, a cow? <laughs> and she got so mad, but I, she goes, it's not the letter C, it's C, the word. And I'm like, Okay, but she didn't think it was funny, but I'm like, I don't know what it means. But like you I said, a little sarcasm coming yeah, out there. <laughs> like I said, I was raised sarcastic. But um, yeah, it just wasn't a part of our lives. I mean, we had the typical commercialized Christmas and um, Easter, where my dad would at Christmas time bust out all the Reader's Digest record collections of Christmas music, and of course the soundtrack to Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> <laughs> and then he'd play that again at Easter time. And usually when we prayed before meals, it would only be at Easter and Christmas and sometimes Thanksgiving. And somebody would say, okay, let's say grace. My mom would yell grace. And my dad would do something like, um, God is good. God is great. I'm hungry. Pass the plate. Yay, rah, God. You know, it's yeah. not any kind of actual faith in anything. Um, my grandfather did give me a Bible once but it was only the New Testament. And my dad explained, well, Protestants think that's the only important part. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I started reading it. And I got to the part where it says that, uh, 
I think it was the book of Matthew. It says that, you know, you go to your room and you pray to God and he sees all. And, and I asked my dad about it. He goes, that's all you need to know. So you don't have to go to church. You just go in your room, pray if you want to pray, and that's all you need. So I kind of left it at that hmm. through high school. Um, I suffered really badly from depression. Hmm. And um, I was very, very dark life. Hmm. And unhappy and miserable most of the time. I didn't understand the concept of making friends. And um, a lot of the times when I was contemplating suicide, the thing that got me through it was just crying and begging to God, give me a purpose, give me some reason to be alive. Because I'm not seeing it, I, I wasn't getting it, whatever it was. Were you talking to people about this depression stuff or was it just all in? Um, it in was all inside. Yeah. Um, I did in high school try to reach out and get help and the psychiatrist that evaluated well the counselor evaluated me then i went to a psychiatrist and he goes we need you to stay here a couple of weeks and i'm like i think my parents would notice me missing so no thank you but <laughs> so i didn't deal with it at yeah. that time at all because yeah. it was something i did without my parents knowledge hmm. and if i stayed for two weeks that they would definitely notice <laughs> yeah. um yeah like all my all my life i looked at experiences as being positive um the more experiences the better like i drove in demolition derbies when i was a kid um and always it was that moment in the car right before you go into the arena you're like why am i here what was i thinking <laughs> but it was a rush to do it and um when we were kids there was a couple of summers we went to the up of michigan and spent the summer at a hippie commune and you learn important things like when you skinny dip in a river, use ivory because it floats. And all the rest of the soap sink to the bottom, you lose them. You know, um, we grew up with all kinds of animals around, always having pets. We had goats and rabbits and chickens and um, dogs and cats and occasionally ducks and pigeons and horses and ponies. And we had a fox for a while. Wow. And it was just always very much about my parents letting us have experiences mm -hmm. but it wasn't ever tied to religion or faith or anything it was that was like the one thing that was really missing and i kept noticing it now in middle school is when we had to do a genealogy project project for gt class and that's when i started reading about my great grandfather adam who was he and his wife alice were missionaries in india for the brethren church and they had lost several children. I think it was six kids before the age of five. Wow. And he mm. would just write these heartbreaking poems mm. that would just put you in tears. But they always had, towards the end of it, how even though he didn't understand it, he knew that it was in God's control. Mm. And that he knew in some day he would see his babies again. And then that kept him going. And I'm like, I want that. I don't know what it is, but I want that, you know? So my whole life, I knew there was something there missing. I just never knew what it was. Um, Your it, grandfather's poetry. Yeah, it was my great grandfather. Your great grandfather's poetry. I mean, yeah. If you'd have known that, that would have been a seed, you know. I mean, yeah, it was just it was one of those things that, whenever I work in genealogy, I think about him and the things he went through, and it just, but he never lost his faith, hmm. and it was just astounding because, I know people that if someone dies tragically, they're like, oh, I hate God, God doesn't exist, or they wouldn't let that happen. But this guy, he just, Adam's just like, it just kept him going, knowing that God was taking care of it. He would say, I don't understand this, but I know God's got it, and it's gonna be okay. And he ended up with two daughters that lived, my grandmother, Leah, and her sister, Lois. Lois lived to be almost 101, and my grandmother lived to be 98 or 99. Hmm. So they definitely had a good long life. Women of faith? Yeah, yeah. yeah. My grandmother um, and my grandfather were minister. Well, my grandfather was a minister and my grandmother taught Sunday school. And yeah. um, the only problem was they were a little bit more of the spoil the, spare the rod, spoil the child thing. And they were, they were real harsh to my dad. And I think that's partly why he didn't have faith. Because yeah. they were very much into beating the children if they screwed up. Mm. And actually my grandfather was very anti-Catholic. He's one of those 
that was taught that the Pope was the Antichrist and all that. And he told his children that if you smoke or drink or marry a Catholic, you're out of the family. And so my uncle smoked and drank, and then my dad smoked, drank, and married a Catholic. And then my other uncle, all that was left for him to do was smoke, drink, marry a Catholic, and convert to Judaism. <laughs> so all the boys ended up out of the family. <laughs> well, it's hard enough being a, a PK uh, anyway, Yeah. but but using corporal punishment to, to bring him in is, even adds to the Yeah, it didn't work. It was tough, tough. All right, mm -hmm. all right. And actually, I don't think... Yeah, I don't think any of the kids stayed brethren. I, well, none of the boys did. Yeah. Um, but yet we see the grace there, you know, mm -hmm. in your great-grandfather, the, the grace of God, the mercy of God, and empowering him, strengthening mm -hmm. him to deal with the loss of all those children. And, and, and the seed was still planted into his daughters. Yep. And uh, so it was there. Yep. And it was, and the interesting thing about Adam and going further back is how he got his name. His parents, Susan and Cornelius, also lost several children. They were mm -hmm. farmers, and they had several children die young. And this Indian crone who had just found religion, just found Christ, was in the area, and she heard about Susan losing another child. She went over to her, and she prayed with her, and she said, I know that if you name your next child Adam and the one after that Eve, the rest of your children will live to be adults. Well. Susan and Cornelius, oh, that's nice, you know, and, but their next child ended up being a boy. So they're like, okay, we'll name him Adam, and that was my great-grandfather. And the next child ended up being a girl. So they're like, okay, we'll name her Eve, and the rest of the children all lived to be adults. <laughs> and it was just really interesting to read these stories as you go through genealogy. See, yeah, it makes genealogy fun when you, you yeah. dig up these... Or as they say on the TV commercial, the little leafs that come yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. All that. Our guest is Lori Martinez, former agnostic. All right. So that you're learning about your family and also mm -hmm. their faith and the way God worked through their lives uh, through your study of genealogy. Yep. And my mom's family was all Catholic from forever. And they were from Germany. And then I found out my dad's family was Protestant since the Reformation. And they were also from Germany, Switzerland and Germany. And in studying them, we found that they're real close to the same area in Germany. And my dad pointed out that, well, your family tried to kill off my family. Because my dad thinks, of course, that the Catholics were out to kill everybody that wasn't Catholic. And when he said that to my mom, my mom just looked at him and said, well, obviously we didn't do a good enough job. <laughs> <laughs> so there's always been that kind of contention between the two. But oddly enough, my dad and the Protestant side of my family is the part the group that was pro-life. And my mom, being the f recovering Catholic, actually worked at Planned Parenthood for a very long time and would take me to um, the pro-choice rallies. And even though I didn't know a lot about Catholicism, I do remember distinctly being puzzled by the Catholic for Life groups that were always at these rallies. And I'm like, how can that be? Oh, because you, you related your mother, Catholic, ex-Catholic, and her pro-choice, you just assume, because she didn't really well, yeah, explain but, otherwise. Yeah, but I knew that the rest of her family was very pro-life, oh, okay. the ones that were still Catholic. And then seeing this group that said Catholics for life, or Catholics for choice, okay. didn't Catholic make choice. sense yeah. to me at all. Yeah. Okay. I'm like, Catholics for choice doesn't, right. that, there's no sense in that. And she would say, well, some Catholics just have a little more sense and realize you can't tell people what to do. I'm like, okay, you know, so I'd gone to a couple of the rallies and it was interesting enough and I, I agreed with them in the sense that I don't think I could ever do that, but I didn't feel like I had the place to tell somebody else what to do. And I think that's what a lot of people that are loosely pro-choice, they feel like they don't have the right to tell somebody else what to do. But after I became Catholic, I realized, well, who's standing up for the baby? You know, yeah, yeah. somebody's got to stand up for the baby. So I realized that, yeah. We kind of do have the right, and we got the responsibility to tell them that's the wrong thing to do. But at the time, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about it. But um, eventually, I moved to Texas to get work. I was born and raised in Indiana. Moved to Texas to get a job as a teacher, and that's where I met my husband. What were you teaching? Uh, high school math. Okay. And his family was, at the time, more or less a Sunday Catholic. 
you know, they went to church, but that's about all that was involved with their Catholicism. And he said that his parents insisted, or primarily his mother, would really like us to get married in the Catholic Church. And I'm like, it's fine with me. I don't, you know, I didn't have any feelings about it either way. So he went through marriage prep, and um, because I had been baptized Catholic, the priest said it would be okay for me to get married Catholic. And um, my husband had had all his sacraments, so it was easier for him to get it all cleared up. And when we had the wedding ceremony, the priest came to me with the communion, and he kept like sticking it in my face, and I'm like, hey, it's for him, you know, because I knew I wasn't supposed to take it. And he kept sticking it in my face, and finally my husband just, just take it. So I was kind of force-fed my first <laughs> communion at my wedding. And then he walked away, and my husband didn't get the communion at all <laughs> at the wedding ceremony. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but that was another taste of uh, Catholicism for me. And after we had kids, we went to the Catholic church with my in-laws for a while. Um, but the mass was always in Spanish, so I didn't really know what was going on because I didn't have any Spanish. And our, as we had our children, we have four children, um, we kept going, but it started to get harder and harder to handle the kids. Um, our oldest was five when the last one was born, so they're real close together in age. And I remember I was pregnant with my third child when we were in Mass, and they were doing the Peace Be With You, and this lady reached her hand out to my daughter, and she had this mole on her hand with hair on it, and my daughter starts screaming at the top of her lungs, spider, spider. And I just thought, oh, I thought I was going to die. And my husband and my father-in-law were both laughing. My mother-in-law was like, shh. But the rest of the congregation is just like, oh, that's nice, because they didn't understand what she was saying. She was speaking English, and they all speak Spanish. <laughs> it's like she just screamed at the top of her lungs, spider, spider. <laughs> And I was like, okay. Yep. <laughs> it was really... One of those mortifying parent, yes. parent experiences. It's like, too bad you can't crawl underneath the pews. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was rough. But we only went to church with them whenever it was convenient, because trying to get four babies together in the morning and getting them there was a little bit rough. We did finally get the older two baptized when I was about three weeks away from delivering my third. And then we got the younger two baptized when my son was not quite two years old. And that was more, again, was the encouragement of his family because... Doing it to please family? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was kind of tradition and kind of the encouragement to say, hey, don't forget to do this. And, oh, yeah, we got to do that. <laughs> and because at this point, I still wasn't Catholic. Yeah. Um, Did you believe it was doing anything with the kids or just a rite of passage? Um, I didn't have any real meaning to it. It yeah. was kind of like... Um, my dad always would argue with my mom about the fact that she made him put these indelible marks on our soul and we can't get rid of them now. And my mom says, well, it won't hurt him. And my dad's like, you don't know that. And so I knew there was an indelible mark involved <laughs> on the soul, but I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> um, they're just, I wasn't taught anything about it. Mm -hmm. And um, it meant something to my husband's family. And I'm like, okay, you know, that's fine. It was, my mother-in-law is very, uh, a very giving, loving person. And the way she's raised her family and her, her family that she came from, her siblings, because her mother died when she was 15. And she had, there were six kids in the family and she quit school so she could raise these kids because her father left to go to Mexico or go somewhere else in Mexico to find a new wife and left her home alone with these babies. I mean, they were all little. And so my mother-in-law just quit school so she could raise her brothers and sisters. And so she's that kind of person that just gives and gives. And that when she's saying, you really should get them baptized, I'm like, yeah, okay. Because she just, she has that effect on you. You're like, oh, you know, because you feel like whatever she's saying is a good wisdom, you know, good advice. Um, after my son was born, was when I started really thinking about faith. This is your fifth? My fourth. Fourth, okay. Um, after my, okay, well, after my son was born, it was about the time that the Andrea Yates thing came out in Houston. And that's a mother who suffered from severe uh, postpartum psychosis, ended up killing all her children. Hmm. 
and with each of my pregnancies, because I was always already that was near where you were living. Yeah. Right? Well, wow. and because I was already prone to postpartum depression, I became very terrified that I was going to lose my mind and kill my children. And so, after my fourth child, um, we decided we we're going to be done, and we went with sterilization so that we wouldn't have any more children. And I wasn't Catholic. I didn't understand that it's a no-no. Mm -hmm. And my husband was occasionally Catholic, and so mm -hmm. he kind of thought he had heard something about it somewhere, but he wasn't sure. And um, but we, I was terrified I, after Andrea Yates and the fact that I suffered such bad postpartum depression. I just didn't want to risk it, mm -hmm. and it just was too scary for me. And then after my son was born, and um, after the sterilization surgery, uh, I started thinking about faith. Mm -hmm. And I think it was, I guess I just felt so blessed to have four healthy children. Mm -hmm. Because I had had cousins who had two or three kids and then one would have autism. Or they'd have a kid with uh, some kind of digestive issue or a vision problem. And I just like, what are the chances of having four kids all come out healthy? You know, what are the chances? And then I started realizing that, you know, there's got to be something to this. It can't just be, I, I couldn't buy the atheist thing. There's no way this is just random. It just happens, random. And I'm like, no, there's, there's something there. So I always believed there was a God. I just didn't know how to connect with him. Or I didn't know if the whole Christianity thing was right or wrong. I just knew there was a God, and for some reason he thought it was good to give me four healthy kids. And I was very blessed by that. I'm curious, during all this time, you've had on the periphery of your life Christians, some Catholics, some brethren, and I don't know if you had any others. Did, did any of these people uh, seek to explain the faith to you? Did they try? Oh, and no, no. Um, so they never really shared their own faith with you? There were a few times at gatherings of my mom's side of the family where my dad being somewhat brethren and my uncle who was formerly Mormon would get into a big argument about faith and actually that ended up convincing one of my cousins to become an atheist. Hmm. One of my Catholic cousins became an atheist because of my dad and my uncle's discussions about religion yeah. huh. and she for a while tried to convince me to become an atheist but I couldn't quite do it. Um, Later on, she did become Catholic again, but uh, yeah, they're just other than just strange discussions now and then about which religion was better and who made up what, and of course, you know, the whole conspiracy that Constantine writ, wrote the Bible based on what he liked, and instead of what the real Christians were preaching and teaching, and you know, a lot of those. Yeah theories that are out there. Right. <laughs> so you had a hodgepodge of ideas yeah. all around you. But yet still that grace was there that there's at least a God. You yeah. Know, that was there. And and I kept knowing that I wanted to know more about him, but I didn't know where to look. I mean, hmm. there was just so much animosity towards religion at all in my house that I knew I couldn't go through mom and dad to learn about religion. And like I said, I wasn't real skilled at making friends. <laughs> so I didn't, I had friends that went to different churches and every now and then I'd talk to them about it. I know that um, when I was in high school and at the height of my sarcastic uh, faith <laughs> or lack of faith, I know that I probably offended some of my friends with their faith because one of them was saying something about when we, school was teaching about evolution, and this uh, one of my friends said, I thought you were too smart to believe in that. I'm like, what? <laughs> I said, I thought you were too smart not to. <laughs> but I didn't understand, yeah. you know? I just didn't know any of that stuff. And there were times in my life that I really felt God's presence. Like, um, my first teaching job that I almost took was in Arizona at an Indian reservation. But the whole time I was there, I just kept feeling, and it was almost like somebody in my head telling me, 
you don't belong here. Mm -hmm. You don't belong here. So I ended up not staying at that job and the following year getting a job in Houston where I met my husband. And so it was like really strange, but I, you know, my dad thought I was crazy. I'm like, dad, I don't think I belong here. I just don't belong here. And so he was not happy with me turning down that job and having to move back home for another year, but. <laughs> but you sensed inside yeah, that there was, was a purpose just, to life, not, that there was something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. God and, uses all kinds of ways to get our attention. Yeah, yeah, when I got through my suicidal phase, I just kept holding on to this feeling that there's gotta be some purpose. There's gotta be a purpose. And, um, and of course, once I had kids, suicide was completely out of the question. There's yeah. no way I would leave them like that. And um, my dad would always send me pages that he printed out of uh, sarcastic and heathenistic uh, jokes about religions. And just, you know, stuff that made fun of anybody that had faith in anything, basically. But one of them had this, um, I guess, kind of a challenge at the end of it. It's the one that says that, you know, if you believe and you're wrong, when you die, you've lost nothing. But if you don't believe and you're wrong, and you die, you lost everything. Uh, it's called Pascal's waiver, yeah. wager. Wager, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I started thinking about that, and I'm like, that's, that's deep, you know? <laughs> and I've always been a very logical person, very logical. I drove some of my math professors in college crazy because I was too logical to them, which you wouldn't think you would with <laughs> math professors. But they always told me I was too smart to be a teacher. They go, you're not going to be able to stand being a teacher. You're too intelligent. It's going to make you crazy. <laughs> Prove them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Pascal's logic would appeal to you. Yes, it did greatly. And at, oddly enough, at the same time, my mom had started reading science fiction books called the Left Behind series. Mm. And so she'd pass them on. She goes, it's really good science fiction. You should read it. And between Pascal's Wager and the Left Behind series, it really got me thinking. And then um, my husband was a book study at work and they were reading one of Joel Olstein's books. And so he goes, I think you would like this. So he brought that home and I started reading that one too. And it's just like all these pieces started coming together, but I still didn't know where to go with it. All right. Why don't we pause there, Lauren? Okay. We'll take a break and we'll come back with Pascal's Wager, Joel Olstein's books, a Left Behind series and, uh, and all these seeds that are uh, coming on you like a perfect storm. Yes. All right, well, let's take a break and we'll come back. Okay. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host, and our guest tonight is Laurie Martinez, former agnostic. And, uh, okay, I paused you in the middle of you were being inundated from all angles. Uh, Pascal's Wager, you were getting the, the Left Behind series, End of the World, Rapture, uh, and all of that. And then Joel Osteen, which mm -hmm. I can't remember. I don't think Joel Osteen's into the Rapture, end of the... No, you know, he's, he's just more of the he's happy... Health, kind health and of, wealth, kind yeah. of, health and wealth. Okay, so you're getting all that at the same time. Your dad even passed that along to you. Yeah, I know. That's yeah. probably one of his biggest regrets, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, uh, yeah, and, and there was a few things leading up to it that I, I um, that was also in the back of my mind. You know, the my great-grandfather and his faith always stayed with me. Hmm. Um, there was a door-to-door -door Baptist guy that came by one time shortly after my first child was born, and he was explaining to me, how I needed to get saved and my daughter needed to get saved. And I'm like, she's two months old. And he's like, well, she's already a sinner. And I'm like, she <laughs> hasn't sinned. <laughs> and, you know, I was, I didn't know anything about the whole original sin stuff, but I was trying to explain to her, she hasn't done anything wrong. And he's like, 
every time she cries, she's manipulating you, and that's a sin. And I'm like, dude, you don't call my baby a sinner right here in my face. I was very unhappy with that man. But he's explaining to me how if I just get saved, it's all good, and I'll go to heaven no matter what. And he was telling me about his prison ministry, and I'm like, so you're telling me that some guy that's in prison for murder, if he gets saved, he says that he believes in Jesus, he's going to heaven no matter what. Yeah. I said, so if he gets out of prison, he kills somebody else, he's still going to heaven. Yeah, once you're saved, you're always saved. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense. He goes, no, once you confess that faith in Jesus, it doesn't matter what you do, you go to heaven. And at that point, I'm like, I don't think I want anything to do with this Christianity stuff because it doesn't make any sense because I'm more of the logic type person. Um, but then I was hit later on with Pascal's wager. That made sense. And I'm trying to balance the two. This doesn't make sense, but this makes sense. So how do I figure out what to believe? Um, and I had had other experiences with God nudging me in a certain direction. Um, there was a f very good friend of mine, Jackie, that died shortly um, after I'd moved to Houston. It was a few years in. She was like my mom away from home. Mm. And um, we would go play genealogy at the library, and we just always had a good time visiting. And she passed away during the night, um, something to do with her blood pressure, I think. Wow. And I was just so devastated. and. I, at that time, I wasn't Catholic. I didn't understand what happened to you when you die. As far as I was concerned, you become warm dirt, you know? <laughs> I didn't know. And I, it was just hit me so hard. And I just, I was just really, truly devastated. And one night, I dreamt I was at work, and Jackie Mo was coming down the hallway. And I'm like, Jackie, you're dead, you can't be here. She goes, I know, but I had to tell you something. I'm like, what? She goes, I'm okay. And I'm like, what? She goes, you need to know I'm okay. I'm okay now. And I woke up and I wasn't feeling that weight of being in grief anymore. The grief was gone. I still missed her, but I knew she was okay. So it was all good. And it was just such a, like a weight lifted off of me and as much as I still missed her, knowing she was okay made it okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I felt good about that. And so it was a really um, strange experience. I didn't know how to explain it, but I knew that Jackie was okay. <laughs> so all these things are coming together now. And I'd lived at the house at that point probably 10, 11 years. And on the back road behind us, there was this little sign, a billboard in the middle of a cornfield that said, Jesus, I'm a sinner, but I don't want to go to hell. Please come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. And I ignored it all the time. It didn't mean anything to me. I'm like, oh, that's a nice billboard. But I didn't have any faith in it because as far as I knew, Jesus was just another myth like Hercules. And about the time that the Left Behind series and Joel Osteen's book and Pascal's Wager all came together. I paid attention to the billboard. And I actually, the few times I drove past it to and from the grocery store, I worked on memorizing it. But I still wasn't sure about the Jesus part. Mm -hmm. So for a few nights, I decided I would start praying that prayer, but I changed it. So I said, God, I'm a sinner. I knew God was real but I don't want to go to hell. Please send Jesus into my life to be my savior. Because I needed to know if Jesus was real. Because I didn't know. Oh. And um, one night, I was praying it so hard, I actually started crying. Which is not good when you're trying to rock two babies to sleep at the same time. <laughs> but I finally got them to sleep, and I went to bed, and it just kept replaying in my head. Almost like I wasn't doing it anymore. It just kept going and going. I finally fell asleep. And I had the most amazing dream. I was out in the middle of, I don't know, it looked like a parking lot. And they were loading people on this bus because there was a war going on. And they're like, get your kids. You know, you have one suitcase per family. Get everybody on the bus. And I can remember it being dusty. 
and like you would think a war movie would be. And my husband was helping me get the kids on the bus, and um, somebody yelled, we need help over here. And I said, you take the kids, get them to safety, I'll catch up with you later. And these buses that were like ambulances, but they were the size of buses, were coming in with wounded soldiers. And this man uh, signaled me to come over, and he was blessing them. He would say, do you want to be saved? And they would either nod if they could move their head, or they would say yes if they could speak. But a lot of them were very, very injured and on the verge of dying. And then he would say, may God find in your heart what you claim with your mouth. And then he would cross them on the forehead with his thumb. And he goes, I need you to help me. And I'm like, okay. So I started following him around, and I would be doing this. And, and as he was doing it, he started crying more and more. There was just tears rolling down his face. And then I started crying too. And I'm like, there's, I remember most vividly this one soldier. Part of his head was gone. It was like you could see his eye and his ear and part of his, most of his nose and part of his mouth. And so I had to cross him on his cheek because there was so much damage here. And I'm like, do you want to be saved? And he nodded his head, what was left of it. And I just crossed him. I said, may God find in your heart what you claim with your mouth. And I was crying. And I looked around and this other guy that I'd been following was gone. And so I, I finished the last couple of soldiers on that bus, and I got off the bus, and I knew I had to find him. And for some reason at that moment, I knew he was Jesus. I just knew it was Jesus. And I saw this building, and I had, for some reason, I thought it was a church, but it was, it was in bad shape. And I think it was because of the war. And I went over to it, and, I, and just as I got it to it to reach the door, the doors came open, and he was standing there, and I just remember there was gold behind him. Just a lot of gold. And he smiled, and it was the most amazing smile. And it was like just joy emanating. And I was like, should I go to the church? And he, he nodded yes. He said yes. And I said, should I go to a Catholic church? And I woke up, and I'm like, ah! <laughs> I don't know what church to go to. Because at the time, the only church I'd been thinking about going to was a Brethren church, because that was the church that my great-grandfather had gone to. And I had found one in Houston. I mean, it was a ways away, but it wasn't impossible to get there. It was maybe 25, 30 miles. And I'm like, that's the only one I'd even looked up. <laughs> but the smile on his face made me feel like I should go to this Catholic church. And I'm like, so I told my husband, I said, I think we need to go to Catholic church. He's like, okay, why? And I told him about the dream. He goes, okay, sure. <laughs> so. You know, uh, one part of the dream uh, that, that's, I mean, it's all amazing and powerful dream, the blessing, the blessing aspect of that wouldn't have been a part of your, your brother. No, or I don't know nothing. where that came from. Yeah. I, I mean, I'd never heard anything like it before. I'd never seen the, maybe in a movie somewhere. I don't know. But I'd never seen anything like that or heard anything like that. And it was just so powerful to me mm -hmm. that I knew that he had to be Jesus. And that's why I had to go find him. Mm -hmm. And I had to ask him, should I go to church? <laughs> and I had to ask him which and church. And trying to get back to sleep. Yeah. I remember that when I... <laughs> and I'm like, what, 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 I gotta yeah. sleep one drink. What, what did he say? <laughs> yeah. But the, just the, the smile. And it's one of those images that never... Get, leaves your head. It's just burned into your brain. <laughs> and it was so strange for a while after that when I'd go to different churches, I'm like, that's not what Jesus really looks like. Mm -hmm. He's got the eyes right, but the hair's not right. You know, <laughs> it's like, because I'd always compare him to that, that vision in my head. <laughs> but um, it ended up there was a Catholic church like a mile and a half from our house. I mean, I'd driven past it, but I never thought anything of it, never realized what it was, just another church. So we ended up going to church there. And um, that was the first Sunday after I had that dream was Palm Sunday of 2006. So we ended up going to St. Edward's. And um, they had just um, moved from their old church into the new church building because their old church had gotten way too small and they turned it into the Parish Life Center and they just started 
going into the new church. So we never had gone to the old church, but it was like a brand new place. And um, it was really interesting for me because I'm like, yeah, now I'm in a Catholic mass and it's in English <laughs> and I can understand what's going on. It was really um, like coming home. It was beautiful. And um, I joined RCI right away. Um, there was a group called the, um, they, they were put on a thing called the Christian Life Seminar. It's the Couples for Christ. Hmm. And so we joined that, we went through the Christian Life Seminar and joined the Couples for Christ. And they're the most loving, warm people. Um, it was just amazing how much they gave to us and tolerated our children running around being crazy the whole time. Um, yeah, it was just, and then that following um, spring, March of 2007, I uh, was confirmed. All right. And it's finally Catholic. Did your husband go through the same process with you in the well, RCA? Because he was already. No, he was already confirmed. Right. Yeah. Um, but every time I went to an RCA, RCIA class, I would come home and tell him stuff because he had never learned any of this stuff. He had gone through, got his First Communion, and then there was nothing except for Sunday Mass until he was in the military, and they said, oh, do you want to be confirmed? He's like, yeah, sure. And then he got confirmed, but there was no real education in the faith. And so I would come home, and I'm like, do you know that they teach this? And he's like, no, I didn't know that. So it was like he was learning with me about the faith. And then um, a few years after that, we went through a program called um, Formation Towards Christian Ministry, the FTCM. And we learn so much more. And it's like, I'm so hungry to learn more and more. Mm. And I get in trouble every time we go to the Houston Catholic store because I'm buying all these books to read. <laughs> and I spend way too much money on it. But uh, just I, it's like sucking up everything I could read. And my um, sponsor for RCIA, she ended up giving me some Scott Hahn books. And so <laughs> that was even more amazing to read his journey and stuff like that. It just... I just can't learn enough about it. I'm still reading everything I can. Did you encounter that Jesus again you saw in your dream? No, <laughs> but I know he's still there. And um, it's amazing when I pray, if I get really deep into my prayers, his face is like refreshed in my mind. Hmm. But I've never had the dream again. What I, w what I meant was, and I, I, I understand that, what I meant was that a lot of people can join the church and go through the hoops and join the process, but not really encounter Christ, you know, not really grow in faith. And do you look back at a time during that process when did your faith come alive in our Lord? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, the Couples for Christ was just uh, the best part of it. Um, they were such loving and giving people. And there was a time in which our house flooded, the pipe under the kitchen sink broke and it flooded the house all night long. It didn't wake us up. And my husband got out of bed in the morning and standing in water and he's like, something's really wrong. <laughs> and um, the couples for Christ came out the next day and they brought food and they entertained the children and they brought tools, garbage bags, and they helped us tear out everything. All the flooring was gone. We had to cut out all the walls from two feet down from the drywall being damaged and they just, they spent the whole day helping us out and we didn't even ask. They just showed up, you know, because we had called and said, we're not gonna be making it to the meeting because this is what happened. And instead of them having the meeting anyhow, they just brought everybody over to our house and helped us clean up our home. It was just amazing. It was so much love hmm. and uh, just the gift of them being there for us. Well, some of the things that are unique about the Catholic faith compared to your brethren influence, of course, are the sacrament sides mm -hmm. of that. Uh, talk a bit about that, especially let's say we've got a brethren viewer watching and they're wondering, mm -hmm. oh, what about the, the sacramental side of the Catholic faith for you? I think that, well, primarily the Eucharist is just the, the feeling and knowing that it's real, not just a little cookie <laughs> and a thimble full of Kool-Aid or something. <laughs> Knowing that it's real, it's really the body and blood of Jesus. It's just, it's an overwhelming sensation. Um, when I was married, I was force fed my first communion. Mm -hmm. And 
I didn't get it. I mean, I didn't really understand what it was. But then going through RCIA and finding out what it really was, and then being able to be confirmed and truly receiving my first communion mm -hmm. at that point was just so overwhelming because you're not play acting, it's real. You know, it's like when you're a little kid and you play school, oh, well, that's nice. But then when you become a teacher and you're really teaching, it's a totally different sensation. It's a different feeling. Mm -hmm. When you have pretend body and blood, you know, you just have the bread and the wine, it's so different than when you truly receive the body and blood. It's just, mm -hmm. it, it's mind boggling the difference that it makes, the sensation, the meaning in it. Yeah, if it's merely a symbol, then the whole meaning of the event is nothing more than an intellectual reminder. It's just mm -hmm. something of our mind. I'm remembering and maybe yeah. it gets me enthused a little bit more, but, but the reality that as you were talking about the indelible mark of baptism, that the Eucharist is also mm -hmm. uh, something that experiencing our, the true experience of our Lord Jesus, body, blood, soul, divinity, but also it does something to us in reality. Yes. More than a mental reminder, it touches our soul. Yes. In the deepness of that. Yeah, and, and I remember even with, after I finally was allowed to start receiving communion regularly, my kids keep wanting to reach up and say, I want it too, I want it too. And I said, well, you will eventually, just not yet. And I think with them learning what it really is, made it much more meaningful when they finally received it. Because if you just give it to them in practice or pretend, it's not as meaningful. Also thinking about that, that well-meaning Baptist neighbor that stopped by that tried to talk you into uh, being saved, being saved <laughs> uh, and that once you made that statement, it didn't matter how you lived because of something you did at that moment, if you'd accepted Jesus, no matter what. And uh, I look back on that now, how do you understand the Catholic understanding of holiness? And Well, the way I see it is that, okay, when you're baptized, your sins are washed away. When you go to confession, your sins are absolved. But every time you sin, I, being a math teacher, I look at it mathematically. <laughs> You're on the path from here to God, and it's a straight line. But every time you sin, you go off a degree or two. And so the farther along you are, the farther away you are from God. But when you go to confession, it's like a realignment. You're back on the path. <laughs> and so, yes, every time you sin, you're drifting away from where you're supposed to be. So you get further and further off track. But there's ways to get back on track. And I think that, unfortunately, many people don't understand that. And they think, once you're saved, you're always saved. But yeah, but you're off over here now. And if you get further off, there's no way for you to get back. And they don't, in the other churches, they don't have that possibility. They don't have that way to get back on the straight path. Yeah, that, that uh, verse in Ephesians 2 that says, you know, by grace through faith, saved by grace through faith and not by works, you know, and that understanding which we as Catholics would agree 100% because that coming back online, realigning like the spaceship, getting mm -hmm. back in line to hit the moon, you know, if it gets off a little bit, is grace that empowers us to realize we did something wrong and to empower us to say we're sorry and to empower us to, to Come back, fix ourselves come and get back on track. We're still free to respond. Mm -hmm. We can decide not to, but yet we're empowered to make that decision back. It isn't our own work that gets us back, but that's a, a fleshing out of our faith. Yeah. And one of the things that I know that um, a lot of people have a problem with in their faith of God is they don't understand why He allows things to happen. Hmm. And that's something that's really, I think, hit home with my parents because a few years ago my, my younger brother killed himself. Mm. And um, why does God let that happen? And, and it's even in smaller things, you know, why, does it, why did my great-grandparents' children die? But it's not just about um, God flipping the switch or, you know, saying this is what's going to happen, this is going to happen. He gave us free will. Yeah. And part of it is 
we live with the consequences of our choices, but we also live with the consequences of other people's choices. You know, the child that's killed by a drunk driver, okay, it was the child's free will to be standing where he was, but it was the drunk driver's free will to drink and drive. So even though it's not the child's fault, the child's suffering the consequences of somebody else's free will. And even though my brother might not have been in his right mind, he did make the choice. And he is also suffering with consequences of the doctor that, the doctor's free will that gave him the medication that maybe he shouldn't have been taking and the other situations that was in his life. It's not just, I live with the consequences of only my free will, I live with the consequences of the free will of the people around me. Which is also why our Lord says that we, we must never judge right. anyone else, because we don't know what anyone else is thinking. We don't know the situations of their life or what, what they're dealing with. And here we are in the year of mercy, and we're recognizing that God does know Mm -hmm. the heart of your brother and the heart of... And that was one thing that was hard. There's people that would say, well, um, don't you Catholics believe that if you kill yourself, you go straight to hell? And I'm like, no. Well, well <laughs> There's a lot of Christians that believe that, but... Well, we would no. believe that, yeah, that's a mortal sin, but yeah, we also but recognize that God knows... He's got to be responsible for that decision. And, and there's, God knows the person's yes. heart. We leave them to the mercy of God. Exactly. The little child, all your great-great-grandkids. Yeah. Right. Uh, siblings uh, who died, God knows those little souls. And the church has mm -hmm. always recognized the mercy of that. We, right. uh, and we always leave room for God. And I think that's one thing that I've really appreciated about our Catholic faith that I didn't deal with very well when I was a Presbyterian pastor, how to answer that. I mean, not very far from the studio are two Presbyterian churches, and there's first Presbyterian, second Presbyterian, and they exist almost a block away from each other because they got in a splitting argument over whether someone's baby who died without baptism is going to heaven or hell. You know, they, that's the reason they're split. Yeah. You know, and the beauty of the church that recognizes the mercy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we rest on that. We do have an email. Neil from Indianapolis writes, did Lori find it difficult in accepting that as a practicing Catholic, you can't just believe whatever you want or disagree with Catholic doctrine? Was it a hard transition from basically not having a belief system to being committed to a church where there is no, there is so much doctrine that you need to believe? Um, yes and no. I mean, that's the easy answer, right? <laughs> Very good political answer. The, the hard part was learning about all the things. Hmm. Um, I thank God for the, the catechism. Um, but once I learned about them and understood why, it was all very logical, so it was very easy for me to accept. Um, the hard part was trying to, to absorb all of it. There's just so much, but it actually makes life so much easier that I was actually for a while a little bit angry that nobody told me about Catholicism 30 years sooner. You know, <laughs> life would have been so much easier. Um, I think because it explains why we believe what we believe. Yeah. And it makes it simple to understand. And like I said, I'm very logic oriented. And the beliefs make sense. It's not like, oh, we worship the sun god because the sun comes up and goes down. You know, mm -hmm. that doesn't make sense if you think about it, because why is this the sun a god? And why is the moon a different god? <laughs> and it's, but the beliefs in the Catholic Church, once you get into them and start understanding them, they, they make a lot of sense. They, they fit it's, together, which yeah. is beautiful. Did you read the catechism on your journey in? Yes, that was part of the work that I went through with the RCIA. Um, I was changing jobs halfway through RCIA, and my shift work ended up being exactly the same time as RCIA, so I ended up being allowed to do some special one-on-one -on -one independent study. So it was nice to uh, have that as a gift to work on. Yeah, and the reason I mentioned that is because the beauty of the catechism in terms of logic and reason and faith, and it just so fits together so well, and, and, the, and the flow of the, of the catechism, I highly recommend it to anyone that's exploring oh, yeah. the faith. It just explains it so clearly, and it just makes you feel like, you know, the world makes sense again. Because when you don't have faith, there's so much out there that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, 
all those voices out there, all contradictory, and mm -hmm. especially you know, feeding that um, almost you know uh, American idea that well, uh, what I believe is one thing, but uh, I don't have any right to impose on you my beliefs. Right. It's up to everybody, it's up to their individual decision, and so that leads to nothing but chaos. Yeah. So, so there we are. Lori, thank you so much for joining thank us you. on the journey home and sharing your journey with us. And God bless you and your family. And thank you. Children, four children, right? Yes. Right now, right? And thank you for joining us on this episode of the journey home. I do pray that Lori's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.